So we're continuing our studies of examples of protein structure and function, and in this lesson we want to look at the first of our motor proteins, myosin. So we'll look at the two motor proteins, myosin and kinesin. Myosin pictured here in purple on the upper right, and kinesin in yellow and orange in the lower left. As you can see, their basic structure is the same, and yet they're are some differences here that relates to the difference in their mode of action or mechanisms and those in turn relate to their different biological functions as we'll see. Let's look first at myosin. You can see the basic fundamental unit at the top of the screen here is a dimer. So there are two polypeptide chains. Each chain contains a globular head region. There's a long straight neck region and an alpha helical tail. As these associate to form dimers, those tails coil around each other. That's a coiled-coil interaction, as we saw for some of our structural proteins. Let's look at that head region a little bit more, and that's pictured in space filling model on the lower right here. The head and neck region in dark purple. We find that that head has two binding areas. The top of the head here, at the bottom of the screen, is the actin binding site. That's its target protein. It also has a binding pocket for ATP. So here's another example of an ATP binding protein. And as we'll see, it uses ATP for the same purpose as actin. That is, it's going to hydrolyze ATP to release some energy, and that will help it in its conformational changes and mechanism. An additional part of the structure is that there are two more separate polypeptide chains. They're called the light chains, and they're pictured here in our space filling model, the lightest shade of purple and kind of the medium shade of purple here. They wind around that neck and give it some structure and support. That neck region is going to be key in the movement of that head, and it is a long neck region, and so these chains provide extra structure and support. That's their sole role. So in a given dimer, we'd have four total of these light chains. What we'll see is that these two heads, although that they, they are associated as a dimer, they work independently of one another, and that's important for myosin's role. So we see that the role of myosin is to contract muscle. In the top of the figure here, you can see it assembles to form more complex structure. This is called the thick filament. So the tails associate together multiple tails, and so we have this bundle of myosin dimers. The tails are associated together, and then you can see the heads projecting out. Those heads are in contact with the actin, which is called the thin filament. So you can see uh, the heads projecting out on either side of those uh, tail fibers and actin in contact with those heads on either side. What you want to remember too is that the actin is actually a part of the muscle fiber. The role of myosin is to draw those muscle fibers together. So at the top of the screen here we have the muscle in its relaxed form. We still have the thick filament myosin bundle and it is in contact with the actin, which would represent the muscle fiber. The relaxed form here, its role is to move its motor so as to bring those two muscle fibers together. In chapter 9, we'll look at some of the signals that result in this change, but for now we just want to look at the mechanism itself. At the very bottom of the screen here, we have an electron micrograph of those thick filaments. You can see that thick rod of myosin tails here and the globular heads projecting out. We want to look overall at the effect of this mechanism, but let's look at what's happening for each of those heads. Even though they can work independently, they each work the same. So we begin here at the top of the screen. Here is our head and neck region. The head is slightly cocked back with respect to that neck, and it is in direct contact with that actin filament. So this is our starting point. First in the cycle, we bind ATP. That causes a conformational change so that that head region no longer has as high affinity for actin, and it lets go. Notice there's been no movement, either in the head or in the muscle fiber. All we've done is release the actin filament. So here we are at the top of the screen here, the head bound to ATP. It's let go of actin. 
What happens very rapidly after binding ATP is hydrolysis. Remember that means we're cut, clipping off that last phosphate and our products are ADP and inorganic phosphate. That hydrolysis triggers a conformational change and that rotates the myosin level lever. In other words, the head moves forward. It's as if we had our arm by our side and we suddenly thrust that arm forward. This also increases the affinity of myosin for the actin and we'll see how that works in just a moment. First, let's look at its, the position of that head with respect to that actin filament and that's illustrated by the blue asterisk here. So here at the top we have our head no longer bound to actin but you can see its relative position there to the actin filament. As ATP is hydrolyzed and that head moves forward it's in a different position with respect to that actin filament. At this point however the muscle fiber has not moved only the myosin head. And now at the top of the screen here we have our head bound to ADP and inorganic phosphate. It has an increased affinity for actin in that conformation and so it rapidly binds actin as pictured here. Now keep in mind it cannot bind both the nucleotide and actin at the same time so as soon as it binds that actin filament again it's going to release ADP and inorganic phosphate and that's pictured here. So here at the top of the screen we have our head bound to the nucleotide. It binds actin very rapidly, releases those products so it's no longer bound to the nucleotide. As it releases those products, that contracts the head. In other words, it cocks it, cocks it back again. And so now it's returned to its starting position with respect to the neck. Notice the difference though in the muscle fiber. In this case we have the head bound to the actin filament, it remains bound as it releases the nucleotide, the ADP and the inorganic phosphate, it remains bound to that same actin subunit and so the effect is to pull the muscle fiber in one direction. So it's as if we reached our hand forward, grabbed hold of something and pulled it by our side. So that's the individual movement of the head. You want to remember in this reaction sequence the head does not remain bound to ADP or ATP and the filament at the same time. It's generally bound to one or the other. The other thing to recognize is that the power stroke occurs at the end of the sequence. In other words, the movement of the mu muscle fiber occurs last in our sequence. The other thing I would point out is that remember this is the me mechanism for an individual head but at any given time we have multiple heads bound and so the effect is as if we stretched out each of our arms, grabbed hold of a rope on either side and brought the two ends of that rope together. That's how the muscle contracts. If you're having a little trouble picturing that we'll do a little demo in class and hopefully that will make things clear. So in our next lesson we want to look at our motor protein kinesin. We want to see how its structure relates to its function and biological role and we'll do a little compare and contrast with myosin and kinesin.